Okay, who who here's part of this part of my class? One, two, three. These these two? You guys part of my class? It looks like you are. But, so if I can see my um, if I can see my screen on your screen, you're in, in my in the class. Is that sound about right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You guys? Yeah. Yes. You guys, you're definitely not you, not you. Okay. So it's basically everyone here. Cool. Sweet. Okay. And everyone has is capable of connecting to the blackboard thing. Who's not capable of doing that? Um, I guess you're the only person who doesn't need to because it's literally right there, but yeah. Um, I'm also, I think Blackboard's recording this, but I'm also recording it. So my, my laptop's recording all of this and I'm also got a mic on me. So um, there'll be a high quality version of this sent to you guys eventually, either to tonight or tomorrow. Um, just as a, an intro, um, I'm, I'm, I work at Cox Architecture as a computational designer. Um, I'm actually just a trained architect, so I did my Masters of Architecture. I've just decided to sort of go through computational design in, in the industry and um, kind of defined uh, the computational design group at Cox. Nina's asked me uh, to introduce you guys to Grasshopper. You guys have had access to IDDA. Yeah, and you've have you been using it to learn Rhino at the moment? Has anyone tried Grasshopper with it yet? Nope. Okay, so this is complete intro. Like you guys haven't ever opened Grasshopper. Awesome. So it's exactly the same as the last class. Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce Grasshopper uh, and a few of the sort of metaphorical uh, elements that you need to understand to get it to work. Uh, I'm going to tr try show you an example of a script that you might be able to use for your project. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and then, uh, depending on how long that takes, uh, we might be able to play around with a few things in the second part of the class. Cool? So, now I just have to remember not to skip over everything because doing this twice is quite weird. Um, so, first thing I need to do is actually start the recording on my computer. So, Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino. Um, it's something that uh, you can, it's free. So, uh, you should be able to go to grasshopper3d.com and download it. Um, it works for both Rhino, uh, sorry, Windows and Mac, although the Mac version is significantly less stable than the Windows version. Um, the reason Rhino 6 is taking so long to come out is because they are trying to make both the Windows and the Mac version almost exactly the same. So right now, if you're a Mac, who's, who's a Mac user? Right. <laughs> so, uh, it's probably better for you to use this with Bootcamp instead of using it with, uh, or virtual machines. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Uh, Bootcamp is a way, is a thing that you can run on Mac uh, that makes, that runs Windows. Um, so should I not download it? That's, a, that's okay. You can, you can do whatever you wish with it. It's, I'm just saying it's not the same. Um, and it's not like what I'm doing here is going to affect that right now, but overall I wouldn't be using, like I wouldn't use a Mac version of Grasshopper to do my work. I would use a Windows one because I, it's not as stable. That's, that's all I'm saying. Okay. If you don't know what, if you don't know what bootcamp is, just use the Mac version. You guys know what I'm talking about though, right? Yeah. I'm getting some, yes, we know all about that. Yes. Like, for example, have you used 3ds Max before? Like, there's various programs that don't run on Mac, and you need to use Bootcamp to run them on Mac, right? Yeah. Okay. So, Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino. You can get Grasshopper from grasshopper3d.com. There's a little button there that says Get. You can download it. You can put 
whatever you want as an email in and it will let you download it. Um, now, when you run Rhino, Grasshopper, if it's installed, you can get it by typing Grasshopper, G-R-A-S-S, and that should end up with Hopper. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I worked out you don't have Grasshopper installed on your computers because when you type it, it's not there. Yeah? So you don't have it. I've spoken to Nina and she is going to try and get IT to get Grasshopper installed on these computers so that later you guys can come in and use it. Unfortunately, it's not the best thing to have right now because you can't really follow along. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through one of these processes, one of these scripts, <coughs> as if you were following along. So that way you can watch this video, um, the video that's being recorded uh, later, and you can actually step through it. Okay. So I'm, I'm under the impression that you guys have been asked to go collect data about a space in Newcastle. Is that correct? And that data is either going to be uh, quantitative or qualitative. So if I just like, uh, if anyone wants to volunteer what type of data they've been grabbing, like um, this person, what data did you grab? You haven't grabbed, grabbed data yet. Okay, don't, don't tell Nina that. Who's actually, who's gone and grabbed data? You worked out Wi-Fi networks? Like the, where they are or, and their strength and, or where they're located? The location and how many there are. Okay, so that type of thing would be considered quantitative data. So it's like counting. It's something that we've got a direct number associated with it. It's not like your opinion defines whether or not there's a Wi-Fi uh, connection or not. Has anyone, has anyone collected qualitative data? So where you've sort of, you use your opinion to collect that information. Anyone? So everyone's quantitative. Like, Banana Man, what did you grab? Say that again. Right, right. Okay, so that's actually quite com complicated analysis. So it's not necessarily a number, but you've actually mapped fractal things. That's quite interesting. I've, I might be able to go into some fractal stuff if you want later. Um, now, what the key thing about Grasshopper is, it's a scripting program, and so instead of uh, requiring you to draw a line and actually to mouse click where you want the line to start and go to, instead you have to feed it instructions on how to draw the line. So you need, uh, with lines, you obviously need points to define where the lines go from and to, so you need to feed a line component those two points. And with that, I can start defining things like uh, a sphere, for example. Really, the, the two things that control a sphere are the location of its center and the radius of the sphere. And those two things can be dynamic, right? So I could, for example, take this beam right here and define its width and its height as variables. And I can take some of these quantitative values. So for example, this room might be picking up, like I can actually work out how many it's picking up. This room might be picking up one, two, three, four, five. So five Wi-Fi networks. So we could we could define the width of this beam by the width, like by 500 mil, let's say, because there's five Wi-Fi networks in this room, right? So what we're effectively doing today is we're going to take something abstract as well no something quantitative we're going to abstract it into affecting a uh, variable space cool okay so before we even get into that i'm going to explain a few things about grasshopper grasshopper is what i like to consider dynamic space compared to rhino 
Everyone here is familiar with CAD software? Or, or maybe I'll ask the opposite question. No one's, who's unfamiliar with any CAD software? So, you, and I think the most common one you've used is ArchiCAD. Um, yeah? Yeah, okay. So, Rhino, I like to consider Rhino as like a real, the real world, like uh, solid real world. And Grasshopper is actually a dream space or it's or similar to like making a cake. So Grasshopper is before you bake the cake, you throw all the ingredients in and the cake batter is liquid dynamic. You can add things to it, you can change its shape, you can do stuff to it, but it's not edible as a cake, right? Similar to like dream space, there's obviously no connection between, like I can't manifest my dreams physically in front of me. So Grasshopper, is in no way, if I, if I do any grasshopper geometry, so for example, this sphere, it's represented in Rhino as either a red or green sphere, but in no way can I select that sphere. It doesn't exist in Rhino, okay? It's just displayed there. Is this, is this getting a bit kooky? Yeah, I'm getting some like, you're weird faces. Okay, so the key thing is grass, Rhino is static, right? Anything you draw in Rhino is it's solid. It doesn't move when you change variables. You have to manually go in and, and stretch things and move things around to actually uh, change them. But in Grasshopper, Grasshopper is actually a really freeform space where variables can change and that dynamic model changes. So you can imagine this sphere, imagine it, it's like a ball of uh, cake mix or cookie dough um, and I can like add volume to it or change the amount of cookie dough that's in that sphere. So I can literally play with that in, in Grasshopper space but in no way is it in Rhino space. So there, there, I have to sort of introduce you on how do you get information from Rhino to Grasshopper and how to get information from Grasshopper to Rhino. Does that, does that make sense? Because they don't talk to each other uh, directly. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna draw a few points as an example. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to draw some spheres because they're easier to see. I'm going to grab those spheres in Grasshopper. Sorry, I've totally skipped a step. So. There are these things called parameters in Grasshopper that parameters are effectively how we get information from Rhino in, in. So you can find parameters in this first tab and I'm gonna go through tabs very, very soon. In this case, I'm gonna grab a geometry parameter. I right click it and then I can set multiple geometries. That then allows me to pick those spheres. So now if I hide them in Rhino, we can see grass, Grasshopper sees them. Cool? So we're in dream space right now. Like, even though that, that geometry is in Rhino, if I do anything to these spheres in Grasshopper, it doesn't affect those Rhino spheres. Okay? So the Grasshopper environment, I'll just maximize it, is broken into the canvas, which is where you write your code, and then there's the ribbon. Now there's various ways that you are going to see people using Grasshopper. I recommend you use the way I use, okay? And the only reason I recommend that, I know it sounds very vain and um, egocentric of me to say that my way is the best way, but my way is the way that people can learn the best, okay? So, whenever you install Grasshopper, by default it should look like this. So components that you put in will be written with text and 
uh, we're going to have our ribbons actually be quite short. What's up? Nothing, just watching. Just watching? Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah. the, the key thing here is I'm quite a visual person. Hopefully all of you as architecture students are visual people. Um, and it's much easier for me to read icons. So you can see the icons in the top. I, I can read them a lot faster than trying to read that text. So I prefer to use my grasshopper environment with icon mode. You can get that by selecting display, draw icons. So you can see now we, we're getting icons per component. Sweet. And then the th second thing is when you go looking for components, there are two ways of getting those into your grasshopper model. You can either double click the canvas and type in the component that you want. So for example, I can type sphere in. But the problem I find with that is the pe people only know a small selection of components when they start and they only are limited to those components as they work. So if like you know there's a component sphere, can you like do you know any other components? No, right? You don't know their names, right? <laughs> So it's, I, by the way, when I ask these types of questions, they're super simple questions. It's just more so like pantomime, just trying to get the kids involved, okay? Could you just explain quickly again how you managed to get the sphere onto the grasshopper? Yep, yep, I'll explain that very soon, okay? So the key thing is grasshopper, um, if you ignore everything from kangaroo on, grasshopper uh, has a ribbon, and in that ribbon we have, what, is there something funny about kangaroo? All right, okay, well, pardon? I can try and reduce it. Jeez, it's already been half an hour. Far out. Time goes quick. Is that, is that better? Okay, can you read, can everyone read kangaroo now? You can see kangaroo? Okay, ignore kangaroo on. So these are plugins that I've added. Um, but you can see here we've got parameters, math, set, vector, curve, surface, mesh, intersect, uh, intersect transform, and display. Grasshopper basically categorizes all of its components into one of those sections. And if you just think logically about where you want to, what you want to do, it's probably going to be in that section. So if you want to deal with surfaces, which section do you think that's going to be in? Surface, right, yeah, super easy balls. You're going to knock them out of the park when I ask these questions, right? So surface. That's going to give us all the information, all the components that are relative to surfaces. And quite simply, in each section, the, they divide those sections up into categories. So in this case, surface is divided up into analysis, freeform, primitive, and utilities. And within those sections, if I were to, let's say, I have a surface, I want to find its surface area, what do you think, which component do you think? Which zone do you think you could find a surfaces area uh, in? In those, those four, analysis, freeform, primitive, or utilities? Pardon? Analysis was the right answer, right? Because you're analyzing the surface, yeah? So it's, it's quite intuitive, and the, the really good process in getting, in getting yourself acquainted with the ribbon is that Every component that is available to you is somewhere in that ribbon. And for you to know where to go look is far better than just learning how to type stuff in, okay? So you'll note that even though I've set this thing up to uh, 800 by 600 uh, resolution, the, the icons only take up about uh, one quarter of my screen. 
And that's because it's actually trying to compact them down. If you select view, obscure components, Grasshopper will try and maximize those, those icons out so it shows you all the icons that are hidden in drop-down menus. Cool? Sweet. So uh, obviously it's a bit hard to tell what this does uh, unless you mouse over it. But if you click these drop-down menus, it'll actually tell you the name of the thing. So in analysis, we can see area and right here. And area will then obviously give you the surface area of a surface. Cool? Okay, so even if you didn't have IDDA and even if you didn't have me, you guys should be able to at least try and do some stuff in Grasshopper just by knowing there's the ribbon, there's the components, uh, this, this is what those components do, right? Okay, so I've covered Dreams, oh, okay, so Grasshopper's in green, uh, dream space. we've got obviously got these spheres here that um, we can control in dream space or cake space, the cake mix. Uh, did, I, did I cover how you get the sphere in? No. no. So, okay, for example... We can run the stuff at putting sphere in either. Okay, the, the thing is, I, I really, like, because you guys, guys don't have Grasshopper, it's almost impossible for me to have you guys follow along. So just consider I'm going to be going quite quickly, and I really want you to understand concepts, and you guys can follow along with what I'm doing can I ask Later. an easy question for kids, not to you? Sure. Does anyone have in uh, the university computer grasshopper? In? No. no. No, it's not installed yet. Because yes, I make, um, it's I not. Okay, so okay. Yeah, I, try, I tried to get installed I will, this I was, morning. I will fix to the second year after two weeks, so I'm just asking for if they do have this in the, the computer. Sure, so, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not there. No, I, I've, I was rushing to get it here this morning, like yeah, earlier okay, today. Okay, um, okay so... The thing, the key thing is this is being recorded, so they. Stuff, I'm not they, interrupting you. I just want yeah. to know if you do have Grasshopper. Right? The thing, the thing is, it's being recorded, and I'm trying to set it up so we, we will go through a script that they can step through. It's just I, I know that you guys can't step through it right now, except for you. But um, I'm, I'm not going to slow down for you because there's a lot to get through. Okay, so. You lost your screen. How about now? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So we've got this dynamic space, this dream space. Imagine it like a like cake mix. We can change it, we can morph it, we can add things to it. Um, when we take something that's dynamic like cake mix and we make it solid, what do we do to the cake mix? We bake it, right? And now what happens after you bake cake? Can you go back to the mix and change it? No, so it becomes this static baked object. And the key thing here is, if you've got grasshopper geometry that you want to move into Rhino, you have to bake it. That's the official term. And to do that, you can either use the spacebar in Grasshopper or middle mouse click. And it's this little egg icon here. And once you do that, uh, I actually have to click it. Once you do that, 
we can see that's now been baked into Rhino. Okay? The key thing is, if I now grab that, grass, uh, that Rhino geometry, that's the grasshopper geometry that's been baked, and I move it, it has no relationship with that grasshopper geometry anymore. Okay? So once you bake the cake, you have to re-bake it again if you make any changes to it. Yeah? So does, does it make sense that sort of dream space cake mix type thing? Awesome. Okay. So, so one of the things, like the key things here are, is that Grasshopper is a set of steps of functions that we take. So for example, I've brought three spheres into my, my script. I'm just going to quickly move them vertically. Oh, whoops. I'm going to drop this in as well. I'm going to quickly move them. So you can see both, uh, and I've moved them up, right? So we can see spheres, the, the th three spheres that I brought in, I'll highlight them in green. And three spheres that right, uh, Grasshopper has now moved, right? So the three spheres that I brought in, they're just hidden. I'll just show them again. So there they are. You'll note, because they're linked into the, this geometry component, when I move them, Grasshopper then gets that moved object and then moves that up, right? Is this making sense, except for you? Because you, is, is this making sense? Kind of, I'm, I'm gonna take blank stairs as a no, okay? <laughs> okay, so I've brought this geometry into Grasshopper, so this geometry component, if I delete that, and I bring, just bring in another one and start from scratch, I, have to bring it into the dream space, the grasshopper space, by right-clicking, set multiple geometry. That then lets me pick the geometry that I want to bring into grasshopper. So we can see now, if I just hide this guy, we can see there's like a little grasshopper sphere existing in that same space. Yeah? So I'll just undo that hide. And what we're doing is we're giving it a function, which is to move it. So we're saying, Take the sphere, move it up by a certain distance, okay? And so when I plug that into the move component, that's why you're seeing all those green spheres sitting on top of the rhino spheres. Does that now make sense? Yes, okay. So when I move a rhino sphere, because it's attached to the grasshopper script through that component, then the grasshopper script responds and moves the new sphere up in its new location. Cool. I'm getting nods instead of blank stairs. So this geometry is being controlled by Rhino, but it's going through an algorithm or a process that's being defined by Grasshopper. And when we want to solidify or make that particular object static, we need to bake it. So we're happy with our format right now. We select that now moved geometry, we bake it, and we've now got baked Rhino geometry. If I move that original sphere, the, new, the baked geometry doesn't move, but our grasshopper geometry does. Does this, is this making sense? Good, okay. So, how can we change the height? We'll get into that. Okay, the, the key thing is just understanding that we're, we're in sort of like a dynamic space in grasshopper and there's static rhino space. We're gonna do a script. So I'm fairly aware of what is. It, are you still in Nina's class, or is this actually a different class? Huh? It is Nina's. It's still Nina's class. Okay. So there's like a there's a broad class, and then Nina's got a group, and you guys are part of that group. Yeah. No. 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 Okay. Are you part of it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay, but the, the key thing is I can talk to you about what I talked to the previous class almost exactly the same, okay? So the key thing, the thing I'm gonna, about to talk through is a script. It's what I would call an attractor script. And what it does is it abstracts uh, proximity to vertical distance, okay? So I'm just gonna do a little example with you guys you are all gonna be monads in a system. Um, it's not an insulting word, it's, it's a nice word. You're all monads. 
And uh, each of you have somewhere on you, there's a point that defines your center. Okay? And what I want you to do is work out how far away from me that point is as I move around the room. If I'm within two meters of you, I want you to stick your arm up as high as possible. If I'm within four meters of you, you can put your arm down and four meters and further. And anywhere in between, you can just work out where, where your arm sits, okay? So whoever's in the class, do you wanna please take part in this experiment? We'll start now. So what you guys have to do is you have to work out how far I am away. Where's your arm, mate? Right? How far your arm is away, how, I'm, how far I am away from you and you're gonna change that particular abstraction, that distance into sticking your arm up. To, four meters is almost up, like a little bit up and like this you should be like, ah, oh, stretch, right? <laughs> now, the key thing is, now I, I'm simplifying, I'm still going, what, how come your arms, yep, yeah, okay, you can stop now. <laughs> so the key thing is that we're abstracting that distance now, I know, I know all we're doing is abstracting distance between you and me to distance that your arm is stuck up. But that's abstraction, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to write a, a script where we take a monad, and all of you are acting as monads, and we're going to change that monad based on its proximity to a point. Now, in, in a way, you could use this as, as Wi-Fi, or you could use this as fractal. There's no way you can use this as fractal, but... You could say, this particular zone here has a lot of fractal stuff in it. Let's put a point in there, and that zone then will respond. Uh, like, we'll do a, we're making a canopy, for example. Sorry, I drank my water too fast. Um, so, I just need to explain what monads are. All of you deal with monads constantly. If you're all looking at your screen right now, you're looking at a monadic system. We can think of pixels as monads, okay? So all a pixel is is a tiny little square, and it has three variables. It can either have a red, green, or blue light on at varying intensities. With all those three on, it's white. With all of them off, it's black. And it's quite boring having just a little square that can be a different color. But if you take that square and you put it into a system where there's a million of them, you effectively get a screen, and you can make images with just those three simple principles, a square with three color variables, okay? So you guys were acting as monads. All you were, all your monadic properties were, was whether or not your arm is sticking up or down, and where your coordinate was, okay? So we're gonna write a script that puts a grid down. We're gonna put me in as a point, we're actually going to put more than just me. There's going to be a few other people um, moving around, and the points in that grid are going to respond to this. And effectively, what we're doing is we're abstracting proximity to height. Okay? I'm going to use the chair today. I mean, this time. Oh, for, does, is there actually air conditioning in this room? Oh, beautiful. Oh, that's good. Okay, so. Without me going, there's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hit some bits that are a bit uh, confusing, and it's what I would consider an intermediate understanding of grasshopper. I'm not gonna go into what they are. I'm more so just gonna say, look, you need to use this here. Once, if you get into this in the future, then you, you can look, you should look into what these do. Okay, so I'm just gonna delete this stuff. I'm gonna delete this stuff. We're gonna lay down a grid of points and I'm gonna put some points in Rhino to control that. So the key thing here is under vector, we can make a grid of points. So I'm gonna make a square grid. Is it still, is it keep disconnecting? Is that why, it, right, okay. Should I? Is it work? It's working again. Yeah. Just guys, just literally, the instant it stops working, tell me. Just interrupt anything that I say. The funny is easier just to watch that one because it's quite delayed. So you're, what you're Ooh. saying isn't matching up with what's happening 
spring? Yeah, it's about, yeah, I can see it's about a second. So it's easy just to watch that. Okay, well, yeah. If anyone is, does want it on, just tell me if it stops, okay? So uh, Grasshopper works with functions, and these functions do things, and they're basically, uh, these little components are functions. So this particular function makes a grid, and it takes certain variables, so uh, these four variables are what's required to make that grid. I'm only really going to play around with these two, uh, the, the number of uh, points in the grid. So to show that, I'm going to make a slider, one of the core components of any dynamic script. Sliders allow you to create a number between a minimum and a maximum. And you can control sliders by double clicking them and that then gives us the ability to change the minimum and maximum value of that. So in this case, I might want like up to 100 grid sections in my system. And I can plug that into these two components, uh, these variables, and we can control the size of that, the number of grid sections. Is, does that make sense? Cool, so I could copy and paste this and we could actually have a different variable controlling uh, the Y whilst uh, we have a separate one controlling the, the X direction. Cool, like it's the, it's the simplest form of parametricism. You've got a number that can change and you've got a, uh, an object that responds to that number. Cool, so in our system we wanna have uh, those agent points. So you can imagine this is this point here, these points, this, this is almost like the class sticking their arm up and down. Um, and so we're going to put points into Rhino uh, that defines the, the type of person I was walking around making you guys stick your arm up and down. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to put three, three options in, three points. So what, what we're going to do is we're actually going to test the distance from each of these points in the system to the agent points. And we, we then have to compare which one is the furthest, uh, the closest, sorry, and use that to define how high the point goes. Okay? So this, I'm about to put in a component that I really don't need, I can't explain too much. And I'm gonna highlight, is, is funny because you know what Flatten does. No, 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 sorry. Yes, because I agree totally with you. It's very hard to yep. explain the tree. Yep. <laughs> Yep, so I'm gonna flatten the tree. I don't, like, uh, if you watch my other video, I kind of explain what trees are very simply, um, but I don't, I'm gonna skip that today. And the key thing is, we also then need to grab our points in Rhino. So we have this point, this point, and this point. So I, I grabbed that just the same way I got the spheres in, so I brought the point component in, parameter, uh, sorry. I right click it, and I set multiple points. And I can pick those three points. The key thing is I need to do yet another really difficult thing to explain called graft. Um, now I'm not going to explain what that does. Anything that I don't think you should understand completely right now, I'm going to highlight in purple. We're going to graft the tree. Now the key thing from this is we're going to measure the distance from the three points to our system of points. And we can find that under vector uh, and distance. And so what that's gonna do, we can get the distance between our points and we can show that as a list of, of numbers. Does that make sense? So what that's doing is it's taking the, let's count. It's taking the 420 points. It's working out how far those points are to, to this, this first point. So it's, it's measuring the distance between all of these points, the points in green, to this point here. And then it's measuring all the distance of these points to this point here. And then it's measuring all the distance of these points to, to this last point, right? And the key thing is there's going to be more than 420 values in here. There's a lot of values, right? It's just something that you, you don't really want to do manually, yeah? Okay, so... Yet again, another really complicated thing, uh, we need to flip the matrix. So we need to take Neo and put him on his side. Uh, and what that effectively does is it gives us three numbers per point, okay? So this point here 
is the first point. And we're actually looking at its distance to the first agent and then its distance to the second. And of, you can see there the second uh, item is only five meters away. Let's make that meters. And then the, the distance to the third one. So you can see here, if I move the third one uh, long distance away, that 22 is now going to go to 40. Yeah? So it's kind of, it's compartmentalizing those distances per point into these little groups, which I'm going to refer to from now on as branches. Okay? So uh, these branches are just effectively defined by these, these darker uh, horizontal sections. Cool? So, um, in our system before, if I had um, like one of these, these guys, I don't know their name, but I also had them walking around and you were trying to work out how far I was from you and how one of, like a second agent, if I was close here, you don't have to stick your arm up, if I was close here, you guys wouldn't have to worry about me because I'm well beyond four meters away, right? But if there was an agent near you, would you have stuck your arm up while I was also here? So if there was another person, let's say I clone myself, and my, that my clone walks over there while I'm standing here, would you stick your arm up? Yes. yes? Right. So the key thing is, we need to work out which point is the closest in this system. And as we can see here, we've got a jumble, it's jumbled up. I can see the system's already failed. Blackboard's not so good. So you're right. Um, so we need to work out which point is the closest out of that lot. If I were to give you these three numbers, you could do that manually, right? So which one is the, which one's the closest? Whoever's close enough to actually read, which point's the closest? Huh? The bottom one? Oh, but can no, you sorry, the of the page. can you identify which one it is in the in the list? Point one. So the the point with the identity of one. So this is something important that you need to you need to consider when we talk about lists, and lists are very important in Grasshopper. It's literally why Grasshopper works so well for computational design is because it deals with lists. Lists in computer science always start at item zero. Okay, so if I took this, this row of students, one, two, three, four, five, are you part of the class? You are? Okay, cool. Yep, so you can take part. Okay, so I, the list actually starts at zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, so who is item zero? What's your name? Nick. Nick, Nick's item zero. And... Sorry, what's your name? What's your name? Pardon? Chris. Chris. Chris is item zero, one, two, three, four. Okay? The key thing with lists is Grasshopper actually thinks of lists not as a line. It actually thinks of them, it can think of them as a circle. So even though Chris is item zero, Chris, sorry, you're Nick. Sorry, even though Chris is considered as item zero, one, two, three, four, Chris could also be item minus one, okay? So as we go two, one, zero, minus one is Chris, okay? So the first item of every list is always item zero, and the last item can be thought of as minus one. So even if we had more points here, it, let's say we had six, we would have to type in, oh, we, if we want the last point, we want the sixth point. If we want the first point, we want the zeroth point we'd have to measure that each time. So it's quite easy to get the last point by just typing in minus one, okay? So what we need to do, hello. What we need to do is somehow get this list so we can either get the last point or the first point as the, the, um, the smallest number. And so it's just to avoid uh, wasting time, that component is sort list. What sort list does is it basically puts these numbers in ascending order. Which item do we want to extract to use to define how high the point goes? Now that we've put, put them into ascending order. Anyone? Zero. Brilliant. 
As I said, softballs. If, if it's too obvious, that's probably the answer. Okay? So we want item zero. List item does effectively that. List item takes an item from each list. In this case, the default is zero. So the output of this will be, and I'll just uh, put a panel in to show that we're picking zero. We're always going to get the smallest number from that list. Okay? Now, before we start playing around with these numbers and start like sculpting this thing, I'm just going to show you what the outcome of using these exact distances is going to be. Okay? So we've got the distance. We've worked out exactly how far uh, the point is from the monad. And we're going to use that to directly put its arm up in the air. We're going to just move these points up by the distance they are away. Okay? So the first thing uh, I'm going to do yet again, I'm just going to uh, flatten this tree. I'm going to unflatten the tree with this data. Uh, actually, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Ignore that. What I'm going to do is transform and move these points, these flattened points, by this flattened list of numbers. And we're going to turn these numbers into vectors. Is every, no one's familiar with vectors? Is it worth me explaining what a vector is? A vector is an object that defines direction and distance. Okay? So for me to move from this side of the room to that side of the room, I just need a vector of y with a distance of, let's say, uh, 5 meters. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right? So you can instruct me to move from that point to this point by giving me a vector. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to turn our distances into vectors. We're going to turn them into z vectors. And we're going to move our points. And as you can see, if I hide everything except for the points, the final points that have been moved, we're now getting some fairly interesting ge uh, geometric uh, solution from those points. So the, the highest point in the system is, is furthest away from every other, uh, it's the furthest point away from those three agents. Yeah? So as I move an agent, we will get a different outcome because this particular point is a small distance away from uh, this monad, and so it's only moving up a small amount. And this point is a long way away. This point here is a long way away, so it's moving up a lot. Does that, is that cool? Okay, so right now we're drawing points. Points are infinitely small. Like, it's impossible to make a point because it's, it doesn't have any mass to it. So we need to start turning this into stuff that architects can actually work with. So lines and surfaces and solids. So we need to, turn, we need to start drawing lines between these points. Um, yet again, there's going to be another purple component where I unflatten this tree. Purple. And that's going to allow me to draw splines along the lines, along the points, sorry. So I'll keep hiding stuff so it's quite simple. So there's our splines, and we can then use curves in a system, yet again, flattening, to create a surface using loft. So we can now have a working surface that, that could be extruded and, and 3D printed, or you can cut sections through it to laser cut, or we can panelize it and give it to a builder to, to make something from, which is directly responding to changes that we're, we're making with the, that attractor system. Cool? Okay, so it, can, can you sort of see the value of using Grasshopper here? Like it's actually, it's very capable of doing very complex geometric systems that allow you to play, like 
right now I could all give you, I could give you all these scripts and you guys could all create a completely unique geometry just using this one script. Yeah? Okay. So the key thing though is that it's only making cones. So the cones are just going to emanate from those points and we want to have a bit of control over actually how the geometry responds to a point because I, I'd hope that like let's say everyone here decides to use this that you don't all end up with conical geometries getting submitted to Nina because then Nina's going to get annoyed. She'll be like, they've all made cones. It's not good. Okay. So this is where maths gets involved. And I know maths, I know most of you probably think, oh no, maths. Like, no, not very many people like maths. Like, who, who, who gets excited when I say maths? Banana man gets excited. I get excited. Maths. Okay. Um, my t-shirt should say maths, not magic. <laughs> Either way. Um, maths is awesome. And the key thing is, we need, we've got a set of numbers here that we're um, using to move points up and down. And we need to control how those numbers work. And the only way that we're going to uh, do that is through maths. Okay? Now, one of the one of the most important things I like to do with numbers when I start playing around with them, with them in Grasshopper is I like to move them into a nice relative space, okay? So if a number's a million, if I've got a list of numbers and they range from 10,000 to 50 million, I like to squeeze them all so that they're all relative between zero and one because that, that's a really nice uh, system. We can think of zero and one as percent we can think of, we, we can see zero and one. Like, it's very hard for me to say 50 million and you'd be able to actually perceive how big that actually is. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take our list of numbers, our list of heights, and we're going to remap them to zero to one. Okay? So, we're going to use the remap numbers component. And what that effectively does is works out where these numbers sits between in a system. So we're going to define how big that system is, and it's going to remap it between 0 and 1. So we have a construct domain. And do, does anyone remember the um, parameters that I defined as I asked you to, as I walked around? What was the extent of the distance? If I, if I got any closer than what number, did you just have your arms stuck up? What was that number? Two? And what was the other number? Okay, so we're going to use two and four. I'm going to use ten as a maximum. We're going to use two and four as our system. So uh, four goes first, and two goes last. Because we're, we're actually going to invert this. So four is going to get converted to zero, and two is going to get converted to one. Now, the key thing here is if you, you can either use the remapped number because it's going to work out whether that number, even if that number sits beyond 4 or 2, it's going to remap it, or we can clip it. So once it goes beyond 4 or below 2, it gets clipped to either 0 or 1. So I'll just, as I sort of play with these numbers, I'm going to show you what they do to the outcome. So I'm going to plug these, this into our Z. And we can see that we have a plateau of two meters around this point that fades down to four. And as I move these points into the system, they're going to start bumping up little pimples on, on our surface. Okay? Cool? So that's, that's, uh, that gives us the ability to clamp, clamp our system so we can, uh, we can actually make this quite uh, conical still if we, uh, if we deal with the zero and, and we bring that in. Uh, but we have no control of the fall off. The fall off is always going to be linear. Okay? So I, we're going to use a system. Uh, it's probably one of the cooler things to introduce to beginners uh, called Graph Mapper. Familiar? No? 
I am. Oh, you are? Brilliant. So graph mapper, what graph mapper does is it takes a number, it associates it with a graph, and if you right click graph mapper and select graph types, you can select the graph that you, you want to play with. It plugs the, it uses the number that you insert as the X value. What it does is it works out where on the, on the line, the graph, that X value uh, intersects and it outputs the Y value. So here, uh, with just a regular linear uh, 45 degree line, it's not gonna do anything. So at zero, zero, at zero, we're gonna output zero, and at one, we're gonna output one. And if I invert that, at zero, I'm gonna get the result of one, and at one, I'm gonna get the result of zero. So we can quite quickly see the result of that inverting. And as I play with this graph, we can actually see the result uh, affecting the geometry. What's cool about this is you don't just have to use linear uh, output. We could play with sine waves. So we could start rippling our geometry. Now, obviously, because of the resolution of our grid, it's getting a bit messy. But if I start to increase the extent of this, you can start to read, you can kind of read that that sine wave moving through the, the surface. Yeah? And I just remember that's all related to our original agent points. Cool? So there is a whole bunch of maths in the graph tables. And uh, the one that's going to give you the most control will be the Bezier uh, control because it's very much like spline editing in like an Illustrator or if you use the spline editor in Rhino, I don't think you guys have really got to that point. Um, but it's very much like controlling those uh, four degree curves, those, those Bezier splines. So you can, you can really control the fall off of that, that outcome. Cool? So there's only one problem here. We're only moving this thing up by one meter, right? It's only either between zero and one. So all we have to do to control exactly uh, the minimum number and the maximum number is we just have to use that remap component one more time, but we define exactly what we want the large number and exactly what we want the, the low number to be. So remap, I'll just copy that. And the output of this goes into the V. And instead of using uh, this construct domain uh, as your uh, origin domain, we want to use the numbers 0 to 1. So the construct domain then goes into the target, and we use the remapped numbers to go into our unit Z, and we can now play with the extent of that. So the minimum will say for a canopy might be 3 metres high, and the maximum might be 6 metres. And we end up with uh, quite a lot of control over the variables in that system. Cool? I'm, I'm probably at the exact same spot I was last time when I finished this. So is, does, that, does that make sense? Okay, so what that means though is you can start, you can really start playing with this system. You can add points in. So we can start adding points and we go back to our original point component if we then go and select those new points, we now have an, that new system. We're getting something quite undulous. Um, and you can actually start saving different options. So we can put, we can actually grab another point parameter and we can just maybe pick uh, two points in that system and we can replace that and use, use that as a different option. Okay? So because you've spent the time doing the work as a script, you can always go back to the beginning and change what, what happens. Every day, I will agree with another computational designer at, in my office what my outputs are going to be so that their inputs, they can respond to my outputs, and then we can work in parallel. So I can do my, the first part of the work, and they can do the second part of the work at the same time, 
and then all you have to do at the end is, is marry them together and the system should work. Mind you, that takes a bit of experience knowing how that, how that works. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yep. So what do you mean? So you mean like uh, if I copy this system and let's say we'll use this point as the as the second system. Yeah. So you can see they're they're actually when they overlap they they're actually doing the same thing because they they're both using that same rule set. Right, so if I move this, if I move one of these points into the new system, it still it responds the same. Yeah. So the rules, if the rules are the same, it'll do the same thing. Cool. If, do I need to repeat anything about that particular process, or shall we move into something slightly more advanced? Okay, huh? More advanced? Yes, way more advanced. Uh, just, just to tell you the limit of this particular software, um, I, I use this to design stadiums from laying the seats out, placing the bowl, designing the roof, through to doing the actual landscaping around, around it. I've used this program to design playgrounds. Okay, so it is, there is almost, your imagination is the limit your imagination and your skill set is the limit. <laughs> okay, so now I, I, would, I wouldn't expect you guys to even move past that milestone of understanding uh, branches and trees uh, within this class, but it's certainly something if you continue with this thing, hopefully if you can use Grasshopper throughout the rest of your university career, by the time that you've come out of your master's degree, uh, you should understand group trees, so grafting and flattening, and that would be the bare minimum requirement to move into doing this in practice. Would, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. Thing is, if you stick with it, you should be, be at that point by the end of this year, right? Okay, so in the last class, I did something, I actually started doing this type of stuff, but with images. So we used Photoshop to define how things uh, went up and down at this point. So you can go watch once once we publish this that last class's video, we can go look at you can go look at that video. But I guess to get some like bang for your buck, do you want me to do something different? Or do you want me to go through the same thing? Because the different thing is is more show more so me showing off. Um, and I can uh, do like a, I can set up a physics engine style system similar to like Fry Otto or Antoni Gaudi where we can actually play with gravity and create catenary systems inside Grasshopper and see them respond to changes as we play with it. In no way is it something that I expect you guys to pull off, um, but it's more so to show off what this thing's capable of doing. Shall I do that? Yes. Okay. So, um, in all, in most, sorry, in most uh, Grasshopper plugins, uh, you're going to find they have a naming system. I just ordered Kangaroo and uh, Winbird for the, the, the room. Yeah. Sweet. So, we're going to use a plugin called Kangaroo. Well, I'm going to use it. Uh, Kangaroo is a physics engine. Um, as you can see, I've got Squid as a plugin, Elephant. Uh, anemone, uh, human. So people people have tried to sort of stick within the animal system. Cox Richardson's actually uh, made we've made our own uh, plugins, and we've been naming them like Wobbegong and Dugong, Humpback, uh, Redback. So you know, there's there's a if you guys get into making plugins, try and stick within the animal naming system. It's fun, especially when you go to a conference and there's all these like big wig style architects and uh, academics standing up and talking about how honeybee is the best thing they've ever used. 
Do they sound like fools? It's great. That's why we named Wobbegong the first one, because it's silly, absolutely silly. Does everyone know what a Wobbegong is? Those of you who surf probably know what a Wobbegong is. Okay, don't worry about it then. No one here surfs. Newcastle people not surfing? Jeez. Got to live up to the stereotype, guys. Okay, um, let's get into kangaroo. So, um, this I don't have to explain much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a mesh down. In that mesh, I'm going to define so, uh, some widths and height segments. And the key thing with kangaroo and uh, doing any work is uh, the ca kangaroo version that I'm using, uh, everything has to be either defined as points or lines. And the cool thing about meshes are that they're inherently just points, basically, uh, with instructions between them. So when I use kangaroo, I'm going to basically turn all these line segments in my mesh uh, into springs to make an elastic style surface. And the key thing here is that I want to be using a triangulated mesh so that I get a nice uh, relationship with those springs. Uh, and we want to break this mesh down into its line components and convert them into springs. Um, the key thing about springs are that they don't, a lot of people think of springs as just being things that compress, but they think it's a, it's a thing that wants to relax. So it will have a relaxed distance. And if you pull it or, or squeeze it in any direction, it'll want to push back with stiffness to the, the rest uh, length that, that you ask it for. So I'm literally just talking while I work. So we want to bring the lines of the mesh as spring connections, and we want the mesh points as agents in our kangaroo system. And now I'm going to literally throw down some really confusing looking things. So we need a kangaroo component. We need a time component timer, and we need to toggle a simulation reset. We're using these vector points as uh, geometry. These springs are force objects. I'm going to set the, uh, the rest length for these particular springs right now to zero, which is correct. I'm going to set my timer to interval at 20 milliseconds, and the output of this is going to show us geometry. And the key thing here is I need anchor points or otherwise uh, this thing's just going to literally collapse into itself uh, like a black hole. So these anchor points are going to not be able to move in my system. I need to work out exactly what these points are in my mesh. So I've got a cloud of points and I've got their relative positions in uh, closest point system and that's going to give me the anchors out. And now when I run this, we can see, I'll just do that again. We can see a very springy elastic system stretching. You can imagine like if I had a super strong uh, piece of latex and I just pinned it at four points, it would create, uh, it would create a shape like this. And I can even reconstruct this mesh because I've um, based this off, off of a mesh. Uh, again, as if nothing. So we've now got that that surface. So we've only the only force that's acting upon this thing is the springs. And uh, as I I can actually start uh, re m moving the uh, the point the anchor point around, and we can see the results. Like it's actually a live physics model. Yeah. So I'll just undo that. Um, so what's really cool is we can start adding forces to this thing. We can start giving each of these points uh, gravity, uh, which I'm going to use a unary force to do that. Um, now, the key thing is gravity on Earth is always which direction? Towards the center, I like I like it. Scientific man. Some people said down, but yeah, down basically. In this, this isn't spherical space, so yeah, it's down.
But um, what we can do is we, we can do a little trick that Audi never was capable of doing, and we can make gravity go up. So we can create inverted catenary surf, surf, uh, structures, and we don't have to work on them as if gravity's down. Is, it, is everyone sort of following along with what I mean? Yep. So what's cool is I can stick, oops. If I restart that, now, mind you, gravity is probably not going to be capable of breaking through the stiffness of this thing. So I'll just set the stiffness to one. So now we've got that negative gravity effect on our, on our mesh. Um, and there's going to be a point where it relaxes. And that's probably going to take a while. So the key, the key thing here is the springs, the springs are actually trying to pull together right now. They're not actually being kept at a certain length. They're, they're trying to relax at zero. So I can force them to try and stay at the, the length that, that they start at by measuring their distance, the length of the, the curve, and forcing their rest length to be stable. And then if I start to set the stiffness in at 100, we're going to see the, that the elastic forces fighting stronger than the gravity. Yeah? So what's really interesting, I guess, from uh, your point of view, I'm just going to try and minimize that, is right, right now, kangaroo you can use kangaroo to emulate real world physics, okay? And we can try and create gravity and springs <laughs> that, that respond and we can see a fairly Euclidean, uh, Newtonian style outcome from that. Like it's simple stuff. It's not like we can throw water dynamics into this thing and, and see water dynamic outcomes. It, we can take points and give weights to them and, and move them. But each of these points has got a gravity uh, power on it. But we could actually abstract some of the uh, data that you guys are collecting and actually abstract to that to gravity. Yeah? So, for example, because gravity has a strength, if I can play with that strength as a slider, so from literally zero to, let's go 100. Then we could, we could start abstracting your information to gravity. So um, the guy with the Wi-Fi thing, he's gone, right? He, he left. Wi-Fi guy's gone. Okay, Banana Man's gone too. Okay, who else, who else has got a, um, what, what quantifiable thing did you measure? Um, the, holes in the, the holes in the rocks. Okay, and you were measuring their density? Um, so their density? Cool. <laughs> okay, so uh, the key thing here, now, do you remember how we did that attractor system? Hey, Andrew. Um, we did that attractor system. I'm, I'm not going to redo it. I, it. We might as well do something new this time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ramp up the strength of gravity. So as, as we move along our system, gravity is just going to get strong. The, the negative gravity is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Okay? because the density example probably doesn't pertain to this too much. Um, so we've got a number of points in our system. I'm going to measure how many there, there are, and I'm going to convert, uh, I'm going to give each gravity a new, a new point, a gravity ramp. So you can see here, as, as we move left and right, left to right, uh, bottom to top along that mesh, the gravity is getting even stronger, which is being 
uh, displayed with these arrows, which in response, we're actually getting uh, <laughs> like more than anything Gaudi could even achieve because we have complete control over the, the gravity of this system. Yeah? So the gravity here is weaker than the gravity there. And so do, do you sort of understand where, what I'm getting at with, in terms of that abstraction? That you're, you're at a point where you're being asked to take that quantifiable value, value and abstract it into, into form. And this, this is that. This is abstraction of values into form. Cool? Yeah, okay. So it's quite like, it starts to really um, allow you to do quite sculptural things uh, with this. And I'm just wondering how much, what I can actually do to, um, what else I can show you with kangaroo. Because like kangaroo can be real, a lot of fun. But like you can imagine playing around with this thing to actually start forming stuff in a digital space. It's, it's very much uh, like you've got control over a sheet of uh, latex. Um, actually, that's quite cool. If Banana Man was here, I'd show you fractals, but he's not. Can, can you uh, repeat uh, comment on this? Can you repeat that louder? Uh, can we use uh, rebuild, rebuild the comment on... Uh, can you rebuild the what? This object. Yeah, as in, can you put that into, gra into Rhino? Yep, yep, so you can see, remember if I select this, I hit spacebar and I press the egg button, then it, it solidifies that in, in Rhino. So that is now a baked geometry in Rhino that I can, I can do whatever I want to in Rhino space. Cool? Okay. Um, what can I do? Say that uh, you have different uh, intensity of gravity in different parts of the model. Yep. Uh, can you explain this a bit further? Can you just repeat? Uh, sure. How you do that? So each each of these points <laughs> has to have gravity assigned to it. Yeah. So you can change uh, the gravity, the effect of gravity on each of those points. So you could actually use the the attractor system that we we just made before to start defining the, the values of that gravity. Or you could, you could use the image system that I defined in the previous class. What that effectively is, is you can paint in Photoshop uh, where the values are. So white being 100% and black being zero. And you could, you could say, okay, in this zone, the gravity is at 100%. And in this zone, it's at zero. And at this, this zone, it's 50%. And you can lay that over the points, and the points will then be affected by that. So is gravity practically uh, interpreted within the software as different values of attraction? No, all it is is a, is a force in a direction, and it's just unrelenting. So it doesn't matter. The, the, uh, it's just like gravity uh, on Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gravity is just a, a constant force uh, towards the center, and uh, it doesn't matter where I am, I'm always being pulled towards the center. Yeah. And so that's what that unary force is. The th you, can, you can create other forces, forces that r act actually more like gravity um, between points. So uh, I'll just delete this and I'll undo what I did. So there are there are a whole bunch of forces within kangaroo um, from the one that we're probably wanting to look at is do, 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 do. it's been so long since I've used this Power law. So we can actually take all these points. Like if I, if I get rid of the springs, uh, turn them off, and I turn off gravity as well, um, I can get the. Uh, we can actually create a 
gravity style system that um, requires that you you have to create lines between the relationships and if I just go to kangaroo and we connect all the, the points together um, so those are the connections we can play with the, the radial uh, exponent so uh, if you want something similar to gravity then you need to deal with um, uh, negative 2 I believe it is because it's uh, a squared and that then becomes a force in that system so now when I um, this, this should literally create like a black hole all the points should just like clump together um, or they push apart okay and then if I set that to minus 5 So you can see they're all like they've all collided in in that system, and they're they're gonna uh, pop on each other as they um, as they hit each other. Now that like the the type of outcomes that you could get from that, I have no idea. I've used this type of system to uh, define rooms in a in a space. So each point is a room, and uh, rooms uh, that should be near each other. For example, if we talk about a house. Uh, a ensuite bathroom and a bedroom would have an attraction to each other, whilst uh, bathrooms and kitchens have attraction, and, and uh, washing areas would have attraction because you want to centralize the water in the space. Whilst you you might want to keep the um, children's room far away from the uh, master bedroom because there's a lot of noise being generated there and so you can start abstracting those types of relationships into forces that push these spaces away from each other in the site and you, you then throw your uh, points into the site and it relaxes into an optimized uh, layout um, and you, you can imagine uh, when it, <laughs> it's still popping um, it's it's actually this is what I mean when I say it's quite advanced because like working out how to abstract things into a physics engine is it requires a lot of experience and I, I honestly I can pull off like a, a Gaudi catenary surface or I can do like a lava relaxation thing quite quickly but actually doing that abstraction I've never done it in practice I've only ever done it at uni so I've I've I haven't I haven't seen people do that either so having like sort of picking that up now and going with that as your architectural style for the future that uh, that you could be defining a new uh, a new movement per se because it hasn't really been seen. Um, we've got about twenty minutes before um, I'm done. Can, does anyone here have like? Can you throw me some? ideas about what you are doing with your particular assignment and I can either guide you into a system within Grasshopper or a plugin that you might need to look at. Before we do that, yeah. I was talking with Tanya. Yep. Um, we're tutoring the course, sure. so we have a good understanding of what the people need, but most important, and since this is quite hard for them to, to follow, yes. uh, is this a, like a you're giving us uh, like a, a range of what you can do yes and uh, so your advice would be that they go straight into the the courses the online courses my, and uh, and uh, and follow them and, and then revisit this lecture maybe my my advice is that they can they you guys can go into IDDA IDDA is only going to really tell you about what each of these components do it's not going to tell you how to use them it doesn't it doesn't explain that I I can, I've said to Nina that I'm more than willing to uh, receive emails from the students and I can answer uh, scripting questions uh, throughout the semester. I'm happy to do that because um, I'd much rather you guys get good at it than watch TV on a Saturday. So um, each of you have your individual projects and it's hard to teach the, the actual script to go for, through each one. So it's more so 
just think, sitting down and thinking through logically, what do I want to do? What are the steps that I need to take? If you can do that, emailing me and the response I give you is going to be much easier to, to walk through that. I believe Nina wants to bring me back a bit later on. I don't know. I think that's going to be more like a workshop type thing where students might, you, like you three might be doing something very similar. And so you would come and sit with me for a, for a period through studio and I would help you iron out questions. But the thing is, if you're, em like if you're emailing me, I should be able to deal with that. And I, I don't just give you results, I actually try and explain it. The first thing I think is to build the logic. Yes. In order to communicate and figure out how a strategy that works for you. So first you, you have to think about what do you want to make and what do you want to have as an outcome and then how you can reach this point without components and stuff like this, but the logic way to approach mm. this thing. And then by talking, you can figure out the right way to construct this thing in model. Nina, Nina's spoken to me about someone who's doing, who did smoke analysis. Yeah, there you go. Is he here? He's not here, but he's following from uh, the, the Blackboard. The, right, which it, I it stopped. I saw him upstairs, it so stopped. It okay. So he, he'll hear this. Um, like, Apparently, he, he's tried to loft the, the smoke and it's made it too smooth. And that's because lofting's probably inappropriate to, to model smoke, like uh, emulate smoke. But I can point him towards plugins like Cocoon, which do marching cube uh, calculations. And that, that will give you a result very much like recreating smoke. Um, or like metaballs, like if you just want to stay within vanilla grasshopper, metaballs, you can start to create smoke particles and as a, as a smoke particle moves away, its, its relationship will almost work like a little puff ball of, of cloud. So um, the, now is really a, like you've got 18 minutes of me where you can throw ideas at me and I'm like, I guarantee you, I will have a, an answer for you, unless you're doing something that's literally impossible. I should be able to respond. So like, throw, throw, throw. I'm looking at um, lava the characteristics of lava, like the behavior. Lava? Yeah. So liquid. And like liquid ones, and you're looking at, um, I was looking at like external forces which can kind of, uh, like looking at the limitations of how external forces can interact. With right. Them. Okay, so that um, so whenever we used to talk about liquid and, and um, architecture, a lot of people want to know where liquid's going to flow. Um, so that you can actually create flow diagrams using a few vanilla plugins, but there's this plugin called Mosquito, um, which will let you put points on a surface and it will work out where that, that liquid is going to end up. Um, we use it to work out on a landscape if there's going to be uh, pools of water and whether or not we need a drain there. No, it's all it's going to do is give you a path of where the liquid's going to go. The thing is, in this, in Grasshopper, you can certainly create systems that particle systems where they do roll over each other, and you will have this moving behemoth of liquid across a landscape. It's just it's very complicated. It's a complicated system. It's, um, you could liken it to Boyd's or, um, so Boyd's, Boyd's are like little uh, particles that, that know not to get close to one another, not too close, but they never get too far. And from that, you can actually emulate uh, the, part, the clouds of starlings. Have you seen starling clouds? where you have a whole bunch of uh, hunting, small hunting birds that stay in a group because that, that's scary. They, they're protective. They protect each other by staying in a big group because other animals don't want to get near that. That looks like a big monster. Um, and, but they don't collide with each other. If they did, they'd fall out of the sky. 
And so each one has a very simple rule. It's stay near my friends, but don't get too close. And, and you get these types of results. The really cool thing is you see that also in fish, and you also see that in particle systems like uh, lava or liquid, where you, because you're actually dealing with atoms, and atoms, when they collide with each other, they bounce off, and so as you, as you hit a, a bucket of water, the force will get to the other side, and that's because all the particles are, are actually waving through. So there's, you can really get into the science of things with this, and, it, and it's, it can get quite complicated creating scientific models in a computer, and it really, it really does get into the computer science, the real nitty gritty computer science when you get into that. There are plugins like this. If you can try and, like if you use Boyd systems to emulate lava, um, that would be really cool. Because I'm sure they could. I'm, I'm sure they could. Uh, yeah. Okay. I've lost my class. It's late in the day on a, yeah, on a Thursday. Yeah, okay. My email is andrew.butler at cox.com.au. Yeah, I'll give you my work email. Was it worth staying back? No, we were just discussing No, no, pointing at this guy, the guy that saw it twice. Was it worth, was it worth sticking around? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yes, Nina, Nina has my email and she's going to give you my email, okay? So, like, and for those listening, you'll, you'll get my email from Nina. <laughs> well, thank you very much. No problem. You good? You good? Yeah. You good? Yeah, we're all good. Okay, well, I hope this wasn't uh, too intimidating. It wasn't? Good, I'm glad. Good, okay. Yeah. When you make that script, do you have to save it separately? Or yes. It yes, no, uh, you need to save scripts. Um, scripts are separate to Rhino files, and they do not, they don't stick. You can use one script with another Rhino file. Key thing is just save, you need to make sure you save it. If you quit out of Grasshopper and then you quit out of Rhino, it will set, like, Rhino's going to say, hey, you've got to re you save your Grasshopper file, and it'll give you the options to save it. Cool. No problem.